Good morning, church. I greet you in the name of Christ our Lord today. I'm reminded that it is our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world and how we go about doing that may be less about us and more about our willingness. So uh, I'm reminded of Romans 8, 28. For God makes all things to work to the good of those who love him and act according to his purposes. So let's be in love with God and let's do his action and his bidding today. Have a few announcements. Some of those are things that we need to look at on the calendar down the road. So we had initially scheduled for Habitat for Humanity for a June date that has been pushed back further one week still in June. I believe it is the 21st. Is that correct, Janetta? 21st to the 25th. Okay, so when you're thinking down the road for Habitat for Humanity, it's a week later than it was originally. Second, another mission endeavor is this Saturday with our Sharing Hope uh, Community Garden. They need help tilling it. Janetta said the plot is very small. They have all the equipment, need some laborers, but she has to know who's going today so she can turn that in tomorrow. It's required by their rules. So if you say, well, I'm thinking about it, sign up today with Janetta and she'll get that turned in. I know we want to make sure that we're all aware of our Wednesday night ministries at 6.30. And I don't know of any other. Oh, May 2nd, we now started announcing this last week. We have to annually do a safe sanctuary training. Anyone who plans on working with children or says, I don't want to work with children, that qualifies you as well. But it's uh, we, we need to be trained. Ross is going to do that for us. We're going to do that May 2nd after the second service. We're going to bring in some pizza. He said it's 45 minutes. He is a Gideon, so that can stretch into an hour and 15. Pretty easy to do that, but we will get that training done so that we can have vacation Bible school kind of as a back to school time frame for what we're talking about. So. Other, you have an announcement. Okay, Kristen, give us an announcement then. Yeah, um, so this is another kind of down the road during the summer, but summer camps are happening this year down at Seed Canyon. And so um, I just wanted to kind of get the dates out there, get to start thinking about uh, if you'd like to send your kids. So we have Mid-High Camp is happening the week of June 14th through the 18th. Tell me who's a mid-hire nowadays. A mid-hire, I believe that's uh, going into, if you're going into sixth grade, I think there's kind of an option between going to mid-high one way or going to the elementary one way. Because um, when I was in mid-high, that meant I'd made it halfway, but it took me the same amount of time <laughs> to get halfway. Yeah, so I'd say sixth grade through, uh, it's like middle school. So middle sixth grade school, through gotcha. Eighth grade, yes. And then high school, one-way camp, so going into ninth grade through, um, if you just graduated high school, uh, is June 21st through the 25th. And so those are coming up. So uh, if you'd like to send your kids, uh, let me know, and we can get some registration yeah. forms and start working on getting all that taken care of. Do you of. know when the open house is for Cedar Canyon? Do you get those dates? They've been sent us emails. Yeah, May 2nd, when we're having our training. Maybe go down there afterwards, though. I think the 16th. The 6th. May 2nd, May 16th, we'll get you some more information out in a bulletin for open house. It's a great time to go check out your church May 2nd camp. and May 16th from 3 to 5. Amazing facilities that are down there and a great time. You'll just feel like you're really not on the high plains. So it's like a vacation in your backyard. Any other announcements that we need to make? Joys and concerns. Going to lift up a couple of prayer concerns that we have. Continued prayers for Jay Wilson and Jeff as he traveled to see his brother. He has a bleeding ulcer. They're not going to have to do surgery, so that's a joy. But he did have to have some blood, and they would just appreciate prayers for the Wilson household. So that's for Jay. Continued prayers for Mildred Freeman. She's been having some things uh, health-wise that are just systemic. So prayers for her health and well-being as uh, they try to get her back on track with some wound care issues. Um, good news about Rob Spencer. He's not going to have to have surgery. Just needs a... Needs a Good cast iron skillet to whop him upside the head, right, on some health issue. <laughs> but we rejoice that he's not going to have to have surgery. Uh, want to be prayers for Indianapolis and uh, FedEx facility and the loved ones who are mourning the loss of, of their workers. 
Are there other things we want to pray about? Other joys, concerns? Uh, there needs to be a prayer. You may know Keishan Williams from Booker. He was killed in the car this past week. Pastor Bill Williams. Um, he's a good friend of mine. Um, he was killed in the car accident. He was killed in the car accident. Okay. Is he about a 25-year-old or something? No, he was probably 19, 20. Okay. Prayers for him, that's for sure. Others? Jazz. Jazz Hallbaker? Okay. Others? Prayers for um, Cambry and Caden Lipke. They will be, uh, Cambry did the confirmation class, but both of them will be getting baptized in the second service. So that's a, a celebration, and we'll be having some people unite with us in membership here in this service next week as well. Continued prayers. Uh, I was talking with Samuel, and he said he made it a week without sinning, so he's well on his way to Christian perfection. His mother said that's not true. <laughs> Okay, Samuel. Hang in there, man. I need more grace, too. <laughs> okay, others? Let us be in the attitude of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we do receive your grace and that your Holy Spirit is within us and that you continue to make disciples for your kingdom's work. We pray, Lord, for our mission endeavors, for our church camps, for our people who are sick, and we rejoice for those who are being made well. May all of our hearts and souls be made well. We lament for those who have had to suffer with the loss of a, a youngster, uh, Keishan Williams, in a car accident, for workers at a FedEx plant and their families. Uh, Lord, for the strife and turmoil that seems to exist in a number of places in these United States, but also around the world. We pray for the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding to guard all of our hearts and minds. We thank you for young ladies who will commit publicly that Jesus Christ is Lord today and receive the celebration of holy baptism. We thank you, Lord, that we have a warm place to gather. And uh, we're reminded of who really makes the sun to rise and to set. Lord, it's a new season, a new day. We continue to pray for our leaders citywide and statewide and in Washington, D.C. and around the world where we rejoice that people are getting their vaccinations and that our community seems to be getting healthier all the time. We pray for employers who need employees and for the laborers to be present as well. It's always a joy to gather together. And sometimes when we fail to remember to pray, may we be reminded of that prayer which you have taught us. So now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have the opportunity to make a joyful noise to the Lord, so it doesn't matter if your noise is all that great. It's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. So let us stand and praise God.
Can I get you to affirm the faith with me and join in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you, and I want to invite Hannah to come forward, do a little wiggle time, and share with us as the children of God. Um, I would like to invite all the little children to come up here with me. Um, and we're just going to do a little quick lesson. <laughs> He's ready. She's been waiting for a while for that. <laughs> tree makes apples, right? So it's this. Okay. So similarly, <laughs> when we were little, Jesus planted seeds in our heart through other people. Maybe it's Pastor Jerry, maybe it's Miss Kristen, or maybe it's me. When you hear about Jesus, you get a seed planted. And the more you talk about Jesus, the more that seed starts to grow, and it grows into a tree, which is what y'all are. Um, and as a tree grows, it starts to begin to produce, produce fruit, like this apple. Um, and then, when you go talk to your friends about Jesus, you then get to be the person who plants the seed, and you get to watch them grow into a tree that produces fruit. And Jesus in the Bible talks about the fruits of the Spirit. There, anybody know what they are? Fruit? Can you say it louder so they can hear you? Wow. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> so, when Jesus gives those to us, it is our job to give them out to other people and to show other people those fruits of the Spirit that Jesus has given to us. So, as you all know this week, make sure that we're showing other people those things that Jesus gives you. Thank you, Father. Welcome to return back to your parents. Hey, you should have taught confirmation class with me right there. That's good. Good job. And no bad apples is what I took away from that, right? <laughs> it only takes one to ruin the whole bunch. I won't say who that was in our family. <laughs> At this time, we get the opportunity to worship our Lord through giving of our tithes and offerings. We'll have a time of singing, and you can bring forth your offerings there here on the altar and on the communion tables. And we appreciate everybody who's giving through electronic format www.faithsw.com. Thank you to all those people who are watching from home who help to unite our ministry together. Paul wrote a couple of letters to the church at Corinth. In his second one, about two-thirds of the way through the ninth chapter, it starts talking about reaping and sowing. And uh, y'all know that this is a biblical metaphor throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. We reap that which we sow, right? So if we reap spare, if we sow sparingly, the idea would be we would reap sparingly. He goes on to continue and say, though, that when it comes to giving, 
that should be a matter of consideration, something that we've meditated on and something that we have purposed in our heart, not out of compulsion, not out of obligation, nor out of duty, but then it concludes with, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And literally the word for cheerful in Greek is hilario. So it's hilarious. Now I want you to imagine the Lord sitting up there that we just said, the Father on the throne and Jesus at the right hand of the Father and he's watching your giving. Is he crying watching our giving? Does it make him sad? Or is he saying, man, I just love how they give. Does it bring a chuckle to him? That's what it means to be that kind of giving person. And it's in every way and format. So thank you for being a fellowship of cheerful givers. Let us prepare our hearts with that great cheer in mind. Lord, those seeds are being sown. The word of God goes forth. It's always fertile. But it's the matter of the soil that it falls upon. Our hearts. Are they hardened? Are they rocky? Are they weedy? Or is it good soil that bears much fruit? 30, 60, 90, 100 fold. When we think about all the gifts that we have received, opportunity to be employed to answer a call of vocation, returns on investment, the ministry that is at hand, Things like kids at church camp this summer. Children coming up for wiggle time again. Vacation Bible school on the horizon. Missionaries sharing the word of God in faraway places. And children reciting the fruits of the Spirit right here in our fellowship. Lord, I pray that we'd all have that kind of heart. And we give to you as thanksgiving in response to the gift of your son Jesus Christ who took away all of our sins and set us back on a right path with the Father in heaven. So Lord receive these gifts. Have a little chuckle, a little, little joy today because we are those kind of givers. Cheerfully giving. Not out of compulsion. Not out of obligation or duty. But it's what we have purposed in our heart that you have placed before us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. spirit of having a little chuckle, a little laugh, I'd ask that the spotlights be dimmed, and uh, before we have our gospel lesson, which will be John 21, I wanted to show you a little video clip of what it may be like to be frustrated.
Stratford is going to die. Okay, so I was wrong. Well, how are we going to find them? Maybe you should just pray for Stratford. <laughs> the church every Sunday. Sometimes Lieutenant Dang came too, though I think he left the praying up to me. Let us stand now for a reading of God's holy word. John 21, starting with verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, We'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net out on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, but they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. I don't know if you've ever thought that you were Lieutenant Dan or Forrest Gump. Both were frustrated, both were disappointed, both had experienced things not going as planned. Our plans are sometimes made, perhaps even without the thought about where is God calling us to be. And the afterthought was maybe you should pray to this God right of yours. And I don't know if you remember the rest of the story, but they started catching shrimp, but it was after something had happened. Do y'all remember? A storm, a hurricane, right? All of the other boats were damaged or sunk, lost at sea. And so that's the reason you got Bubba Gump shrimp, right? And it started coming in in the net full. Well, I look at the Galilean 7 in that same boat, and I look at the church today post-pandemic in that same boat. The Galilean 7 were named, well, at least five were named. Uh, Peter was named. Nathaniel, the first time he's been named since the first chapter in the Gospel of John where he was seen out underneath a tree when the Lord began to call him to follow him. You also had Thomas present, Didymus, the twin, same guy. You had the beloved. You had uh, the sons of Zebedee, which traditionally in the other Gospels, the Synoptics, they're named as James and John, and then two others. It is presumed that Matthew was not present. The tax collector probably didn't go fishing or he would have been named. Luke, the physician, had more sense than to get out in the boat, right? And maybe um, one of the others that we could come up with, some of them had multiple names for the same character, but maybe one like James the Lesser or something. It's irrelevant other than these guys were from Galilee, and the story continues on. And so you could put your name, I could put my name in there as far as a follower of Christ deciding to leave Jerusalem and to go out fishing. And not only in the daytime, but in the nighttime. If you might remember, John's Gospel begins in the first chapter with talking about darkness. It says, in him was life, 
And he was the light of the world, and darkness could not understand it. It also shifted in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus came to Jesus in what time? Night, Night darkness. Uh, John chapter 9, when Jesus is talking about work, he says, we got to work while it's still day, for night is coming when no one can work, and I'm the light of the world. All right, so this whole contrast of night and day, but honestly, going out on the Sea of Tiberias, it's the same place as the Sea of Galilee, just a more modern name for it. Nighttime fishing was usually pretty good. Were any of these Galileans fishermen from the beginning anyways? If you were to go back to Mark chapter 1, or if you were to go read in Luke chapter 5, you would hear the call that y'all all know. Come follow me and I will make you what? Yeah. They tried that for three years. Eight days after the Easter celebration, we had last week's text where Jesus appeared to Thomas and the, those who had gathered once more to share and show little hands and sigh and cause them to see and believe. Now, sometime later, the gospel writer isn't as concerned about the time of the week now as he is the hour of the event. And, and sometimes things don't work out the way we plan them to overnight. Sometimes we need to be remembered of Lamentations 3.22 where it says, Great is thy faithfulness, your mercies are made new every morning. We get ourselves all in a rush. We have our own plans. And a lot of commentators like to have good fun with this Galilean seven. Where is their faith? They went back to what they knew. They're out fishing instead of praying. But I don't see it like that at all. I see it as it was time to get back to doing something. You ever feel that way after the pandemic? I look around at people, I'm like, what have you done in 365 days? And I, well, I thought about doing something. And the church is this no different. We're not immune from that. We've been trying to get going, and it feels like, hey, we're beginning to break free. But you start looking around, and you know what happened to a lot of churches during the pandemic? They capsize, they close, they're done. So like Forrest Gump, we ought to be saying, hey, that means there's more opportunity. The fishing, we say, oh, it's pretty hard over here. They got a bigger boat, they got bigger nets. That was not the concern of the fishermen at all. They're out there in a little Galilean boat. They're about 15 foot long. And how many were in that boat? Too many, seven. That's crowded, isn't it? And they went out all night long, casting their nets, throwing them in the water. When I was in Israel, we went out on one of those tour boats that's about, I don't know, 50 foot long. Got an engine on it with a sail just to look like the part. You know, it fools a lot of land lovers. They're like, ooh, I'm on a Galilean first century boat. No, you're not. You're on a tour guide, right? And they get you out there, and they're like, any of y'all fishermen? So everybody threw me under the bus, and I'm like, well, where's my rod and reel and my bait caster? That's how I fish. And they hand me this net, and they thought, ha, ha, we got this guy. What they didn't know is I use those nets to catch bait, so when I take you guys that don't know how to fish, I can put that on the hook for you because you can't touch that. It'll, like, ooh, it's yucky, you know, that type deal. And then I throw it out there so y'all can actually get a bite. So you have to learn how to throw a net and uh, the secret to a net is smaller is better. And everyone thinks, well, if you get a bigger net, you'll get more bait. That is true if you know how to throw a net. And I'm not that good. So I throw a little bitty shad net so it'll spiral out there. And make it. And so at the Sea of Galilee, I did that. And it sinks down. It's in the middle of the day. And they say, pull it up, pull it up. So I start pulling it up. And you know what's there? Toilet lid. <laughs> There wasn't any fish. They don't have a fish one, I don't think, in the Sea of Galilee anymore. I think they have two or three. They knew good and well. They threw us in about 60 foot of water out there in the middle. You don't catch fish in 60 foot of water with a cast net. You got to get closer to the shore. By the way, who was on the shore in the story? We got to draw nearer to God and stop 
fishing for memories. Fishing for memories will get us in trouble every time. If you're a fisherman, you've got this mind like a steel trap. That's all you think about is fishing. You can't remember any of your chores, but you can remember everywhere where you caught a decent fish. And the problem with being familiar with a piece of water is where do you go first almost every time? Where that fish catch was. And you'll throw the same type of lures at them until you're just tired and worn out. And then you wonder, why can't I catch that same fish? Well, maybe someone else caught him or maybe you took him home and didn't throw him back. Fishing for memories is not the goal. Y'all ever hear churches fish for memories? Y'all never have heard? Back when I was a kid, when I had to hitch the wagon. Y'all were all Amish, right? And, and we churned the butter that morning. And we were saying, praise God from whom all butter flows. And you, you know, you were bringing in the sheets instead of the sheaves, right? And you start talking about it and you hear people and you kind of chuckle and laugh because you're like, did y'all have heaters or air conditioners in church? Oh, no, no, no. It was uphill both ways. But you didn't care because the wind didn't sting because there were thousands around you. And they were all saying, let's go to church together. And, and you went to Sunday school class, and it was all full. I laugh because I start going to some of those historic places. And it was pretty easy to fill the boat back then. You want to know why? The boat was really small. You ever been to a little chapel church? You're like, oh, man, it was wall-to-wall -wall people. That was 20. All right, that's, that's how it works, right? You ever wonder if people had better vision back in the old days because they could see what the hymn number was on the chalkboard over on the side? Only like that big because the back of the room was only 20 foot away. It's funny what we think happened in the past. Now, granted, have there been seasons of revival and awakenings throughout our history? Of course. But we are in a new season, and if we don't know what to do, don't worry. Did the Galilean seven know what to do? They did exactly what they had done before Jesus called them. They went out and started casting, started fishing. But they ran into a problem. What was their problem that they had? No fish. And so Jesus, it tells us, standing on the shoreline said, Boys, it's, it says children in most of your translation, but it's meant to be kind of like lads. It's not derogative. It's kind of like brotherly, but also one of authority and one who's lesser than. You have no fish, do you? And they had to be close enough to hear. Some of yours will give a translation, right? Some of them will say like it was uh, 200 cubits away or something, right? But they'll translate that to say a football field. How long is a football field? 100 yards. One pass if you're a Sooner fan is what I tell everybody. One good throw, right? 100 yards away. Earshot. Drawing near to God means we need to be in earshot of what Jesus is saying to us. He says, you have no fish, do you? No. And they've been fishing all night. That is discouraging. But they kept doing it. But now they're tired. They're making their way in closer to shore which also represents closer to the savior and then he tells them i got an idea you ever want to hear anything from someone when something's not going well all the women in here should know that all the guys don't want to hear that all right the battery on the car is dead why don't you do something now i think i'll just sit here that'll work right you're getting out the jumper cables. Do you know what you're doing? No, have no idea. Y'all don't know about this? It's the last thing you ever want to hear is, why don't you do this? But the Galileans had a change of heart, didn't they? Because Jesus tells them, why don't you let down on the right side of the boat for the catch? And they do it. And I think of Psalm 119, verse 133. Order thy steps, O Lord, so that no iniquity may have dominion over me. In other words, I don't need sin to dominate me. It already does. I need the Lord to order thy steps in thy word. 
And he gives them a word, a command. Let down the nets on the other side of the boat for the catch. And so they do it. And, and when they're letting down the nets and they go to start pulling up, it's like, whoa. You know, like, better get a bigger boat, right? One of those type deals. Might even get pulled in. That is a great and terrifying feeling all at the same time. Exhilarating. As soon as that happens, the beloved says, it is the Lord. Have y'all ever heard that in a resurrection story? That's like a comeback throwback, right? Mary Magdalene, I've seen the Lord. Whenever Thomas was gone and Jesus came in that night, as soon as he walked back in, we've seen the Lord. The beloved says, it is the Lord. And I want you to notice who takes action. He can't stay in a boat to save his life, right? The Apostle Peter's always jumping out of the boat. And people make a whole lot to do over why did he put on his outer garments? Well, it says in a lot of your translation, well, he was stripped down for work. He's wearing his BVDs. He throws on his outer garments and then he jumps in. We kind of think of that as comical and silly. But I'd have a better reason why he jumped in. This is just all Jerry thinking so y'all can be enamored by it. The whole idea of this gospel lesson is to be enlightened, so I'm going to give you one. When they ran to the tomb, that was the beloved and the apostle Peter. And who got there first? The beloved. Peter ain't letting that happen again. That's why I think he jumped in the water. It is the Lord. See you later. Swims the shore, right? Plus, if you swim the shore, you get out of all the hard work. Because they're still there with the net, right? Now, revelation, abundance, glorifying. His glory being revealed. John chapter 2, the wedding in Cana of what region? Galilee. They're back in Galilee again. His mama wanted him to get involved at the wedding because what had happened at the wedding? Ran out of wine. And Jesus turns water to wine, but he, he kind of refuses initially, right? What, what problem is this? Mine, woman, I don't want any of this part. This isn't mine. It's not yet my hour. But he does it, and they say, and they all talk about who saves the choice wine for last. And it never runs out. John chapter 6. 4,000 men are hungry. The disciples are like, what are we going to do? They find seven bread loaves and a few fish in this story. And what does Jesus do with them? Multiplies them. Feeds everybody, and there's leftovers. You see how his abundance is ever present? Now you've got a guy who swam the shore soaking wet. You've got six others in a boat with a bunch of fish. There's so many fish, they can't get them in the boat. We're always worried about the boat, aren't we? We should be worried and concerned more about the net. Remember what Jesus told them whenever he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men? What, did they, what were they doing work-wise? Do you all remember? They were mending their nets. And they left it all behind in the boat. The nets are where the action is. But when they get, when they row ashore, that's why I said one of the unnamed disciples, Michael. <laughs> Youngsters won't get that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to explain that in a second service. But they get ashore. Peter's wet. I'm sure he's cold. And what do they see? Fire. That's a foreshadowing of something that's about to fall upon all their heads. Remember the apostle Peter preaching? Tongues of fire, right? The Holy Spirit. A place to warm up. But it's not that alone. They've got like fish biscuits for breakfast, right? And what did they do to deserve that? Nothing. Did they do anything to make that ready? Did they lay that fire before they went out fishing so that when they came in after catching nothing? No, 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 no. The Lord provides. He makes all things for the good, right? Of all those who love him and act according to his good purposes. They were still doing God's work even if they didn't know it. 
And that's true of us today because there's something about him being faithful and us responding in faithfulness. And so when they get to the shore, they're still struggling. And Jesus tells Peter, bring me some fish. So he goes over there. And he doesn't just get some fish for the fire, does he? Oh, no, no. He's a Methodist usher. He takes a smoke break. I used to have Methodist ushers that did that. I'm like, what a witness. Y'all are outside during the sermon, smoking, waving at everybody as they drive by. He goes over there, and what does he do? Y'all ever notice this? He counts the fish. Did you notice that? He stops and he counts the fish, and the gospel writer records for us how many large fish there were. How many were there? 153. And oh my goodness, the patriarchs of the church fathers have had so much fun with this. One of them is if you take the numbers 1 through 17, the integers of each one of those, and you start, don't get out your phones and start using them for calculators, all right? And you start adding those all up, 1 through 17, you know what number you'll get? How'd y'all get that? And, and you know what they all said? It's holy. It represents the Trinity. And, all. and they start going on and on and on. And everybody was so wowed by that, I guess. I'm like, really? You think that's what it is? Church went down that rabbit hole for a long, long time. Then others will tell you, well, that's how many nations were represented at the time was 153. You know what we really know about the number 153? That's got a 1, a 5, and a 3 in it. That's what we know about it. Why do you think we feel the need to explain all that? Because when we get distracted by that, we forget really the whole purpose. They caught 153 large fish, but that is the miracle because before, even though they fished all night long, how many had they caught? None. Zero. 153, zero. It's like taking seven loaves of bread and feeding 4,000. It's a miracle. Now, but the miracle is this. Not that they caught 153. How many of them got away? Zero. Not a single fish was lost in what remained intact, even though it was too much. The net. The net works. We're in charge of hearing God throwing it out on the correct area. Who made the fish anyways? Did the disciples put the fish there? We'll go catch them tomorrow. No. God made the fish in the sea. They go out to catch them. They come up with the goose egg. Jesus tells them, here he is, the risen Lord. And he asks them to contribute some fish. And the gospel doesn't tell us that he used a single one on the fire. But you know what he did for the disciples? He fed them. And he was revealed. No one even asked him anything. Is this the Lord? Because finally... Not once, not twice, third time's a charm. His own followers figure it out. This is who? The risen. the risen Lord. And we talk about people being hard to explain the gospel to. Could it be us? Could it be our struggle? How is Jesus at, well, let me figure out this 153 problem here and I'll have the answer. No, it's about, do we trust Christ to provide? Are we trying to make something out of our own? So it's really about this networking thing. And, and networking is important. I want to explain to you that networking happens in many different ways, but I realize we live in a different world, a different society, and it's harder for us, it seems like, to invite people to church. Or at least that's the excuse we give. Because we don't all get up on Sunday mornings and everybody's looking around going, what church do you go to? I think I will join you today. But when you had 57 Chevys, you just like opened up the doors and everybody jumped in, didn't they? Is that really what happened? Or were we more persistent in church being a place where we all got into the boat and we all did the work of the Lord? Networking still happens. Let me give you an example. I moved here, it was 2010, August, came up to the church on a Tuesday night, they were doing Celebrate Recovery, I'm walking back at night, there's an old dude in my neighborhood sitting underneath a tree. I thought he was dead. So I stop and say, hey old dude, you dead? Kind of, 
It's not Carl. He's in my neighborhood and he doesn't sit underneath this tree, all right? But he will get networked into this eventually. So I start talking to him about his green grass and I say, hey, kid, that looks really nice. Can I have a bite of that grass? Because he's just laying out there like it's a carpet. What are you doing? Oh, I just came back from a thing at the church. You that new Methodist preacher? Yeah, I heard about you. Okay. So I asked him, what's your name? And he says, my name's Hank. And I said, I can remember that. I said, I think I'll call you Henry. He said, you do it and I'll whoop you. Well, he was underneath the tree, so I could have whooped him. But, you know, I mean, I just chuckled and laughed. Two weeks later, Hank says, hey, I go over here to this Church of Christ, and we're looking at expanding out to the weirdos. Would you come pray with us? In other words, I'm the weirdo. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I start going and pray, and I, and I didn't make hardly any of them, but I'd make a few. And then Hank ups and gets called home to the Lord. And his wife wants me to do help with that part of that service. And so I said, sure. And they invited me, and I'm at the Southwest Church of Christ. And stand up there and talk about having a good neighbor like Hank. And after the service, this guy comes up to me and says, hey, Pastor Jerry, I'm in your church. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, because it was a whole ag convention. All right, because he was an ag guy with cactus feeders. And this guy says, my name's Todd Newell. I've only been here like three months. And, you know, Todd skipped two of those. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm eating one of my own parishioners. One thing leads to another. This other guy calls me the next week. Hey, we'd still like you to come over here and pray with us because we're still looking for oddballs reaching out. You know, I mean, I'm starting to take offense to this. Uh, Methodist people are odd and we can't pray. So I go anyways. And this guy's got a Greek name, John Paul, Athanasius. And he starts talking to me, and he's like, yeah, I'm mentoring one of your kids in financial um, advisement. I said, oh, yeah. And he says, yeah, his name's Justin Adams. And he goes to our second service. And so JP and I become friends. And before you know it, he introduces me to this guy named Doyle Corder, and he's teaching my kids band and working over there. And then one thing leads to another, and fast forward 11 years, and we're getting a new church that we don't even know about. And we get a call from someone who goes to Southwest Church of Christ to say, hey, three of my relatives are in your church and they're excited about you coming. And they teach with Jenny. And then I find out who it is and I'm like, oh yeah, I know him from a dance. And he's like, he went dancing? I'm like, don't tell anyone, he's Church of Christ. It was a retirement party for a school teacher. And we were at the VFW even. All right, so... And then another thing happens that Carl sees me and he says, you know how you go praying over there with those other guys? And I said, yeah, and this was underneath the tree. And he says, well, one of those guys is my friend and his, his brother's in your church. And he comes up to me and he says, yeah, I'm, I'm the CPA here in town. And then his granddaughter comes up and says, well, I know your wife because I went to Seward County with all of her kids from liberal Kansas. And before you know it, you know what's starting to happen? Networking. Networking so that now at least my wife can do no wrong. All right? But you got to throw out the net. You know how many times you throw out the net in your life? Well, that's up to you, isn't it? That's up to me. So you throw it out. You haul it in. And you come up with nothing. Do you give up? Do you quit? Do you say, I'm not doing this anymore? It's too hard. Because that is work. But if the net's not in the water, you know what you're going to catch every time? Nothing. All night long, they fished, and they fished, and they fished. But when Jesus got involved, what cast did it take? The one. Out of the correct side. That's all it took. Jesus could see those fish down there. He was like, forward seeing sonar that my wife won't buy me for my boat. Okay? He saw them down there. He said, that's it's cheap, she says. That's catching then instead of fish is what I call it. He sees them. They did it. When Jesus called those fishermen, he said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of people, right? I'll make you to catch men. He didn't say it'd be every cast. He didn't say it'd be every outing, every trip, but they did catch people, and we're part of that. We're part of that. Because someone caught us, right? What if the ship said, I'm not going out anymore. I'm done. <coughs> Y'all ever hear people talking like that? Oh, man, they know where the church is at. 
They should come to us. Now, do people know where the church is at? Sometimes. Sometimes they don't. That's not their responsibility. It's the calling that Christ put on our lives. So I want to encourage you as a ship to remember that little acronym, FRAM. Friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. Did y'all hear where I had any friends in that story that I just told you? Todd and Carl are going, that ain't me. <laughs> Did you hear any relatives mentioned? Associates? And neighbors? Weren't they all involved in that? You know how much of that plan I had involved in? That night I'm walking home. All I wanted to do was get home. But there's old Hank sitting down underneath the tree, and I thought he was dead. All right? He ruined my whole evening, didn't he? Because instead of getting home and propping up in the recliner and saying, Shoo, I've done some good work today, I had to talk to him, right? Now, if I would have been a good preacher, like in Luke chapter 10, I would have went across on the other side. But I didn't know any better, and he trapped me. And then he lured me, didn't he? Hey, you weirdo, we're looking to have prayer with weirdos. Well, I couldn't turn him down. That's a challenge, right? Because you and I know that Methodists beat Church of Christ every day of the week. That's why I went. And you know what they were doing the whole time I'm there and still go? They just laugh about, we got one of these suckers to come over here. People are going to be talking about him. But it ends up impacting our lives. Then and all across that spectrum and our two churches together. So the next time you think, ah, I don't want to talk to anybody about getting in this boat. Everybody has a church home. I'm going to tell you the truth. Hardly anyone has a church home after the pandemic. Hardly any ship is functioning. They're emptying the net and toilet lids are falling out. And they're going, what are we going to do? And Lieutenant Dan, as a pagan in the movie, what did he say? Better pray. Better pray. Did he do so in jest? Was he even mocking for us? Of course, that's part of the dialogue, right? But when they went and prayed, and they prayed and they prayed, it didn't work out the way they thought, right? There was a storm. But after the storm, it was all catching for a long time. Church, we have been through a storm. A lot of boats are saying, I'm not going to do it anymore. And I want to challenge you. We serve the risen Christ. If it didn't take Easter to get it through our heads, how about the next week on a resurrection story? How about week number three? For this was the third time that the risen Lord had appeared to them. If you're saying, I'm tired. I don't want to do it anymore. You think they felt that way that day? You know what Jesus said? Shut up, here's your fish biscuit. He had it ready for them. Eat this, he said. Chew on this a little bit. You know what happens every time you're worn out and you get a fish biscuit, right? You're like, I'm good to go again. Y'all don't eat fish biscuits? That's why y'all look like y'all do. All right? Need some energy. They weren't just eating bread or eating fish. Who is the fish symbol? Y'all still see him on the back of pickup trucks that are running over people and cutting them off? Right? Oh, ictus? What is that, ictus? The Jesus fish, right? It's the way the Romans used to sign off on to know if you were a believer or not. Half circle, and they, you'd fill it in. They'd say, oh, you're with them. And that's how you kept from getting crucified. When Jesus gave them the bread and their eyes are aware and open, isn't that the body of Christ being aware and open? See, Jesus is still networking. The reason the net didn't break, because God had control of it. They just had to be obedient. That's all we have to do too. Pray and invite. Pray and witness. Pray and work. Pray and let down the net. Still works yesterday. Still works today. Fewer boats ought to be better catching. Let's pray. Lord, I'm so glad that your story 
doesn't omit and say, oh, but the Galilean seven stayed in a room afraid and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And 16 years later, something happened. No, they went out and did what any of us would do. We got to make a living. We got to do something. We're going to starve to death here. But you drew them near. And they listened. Sometimes we struggle to listen. Sometimes we struggle to see where there could be even greater life and abundance after the trial, after the tribulation, after the cross and the tomb itself. There was true resurrection life. The scars were still there. The nails that pierced the hand and the spear that pierced the side, those wounds were still visible. But you gave them the catch. And whatever that 153 represents, it was a miracle. Help us to see the miracles that you're doing. To get excited about what God is doing in and through his people once again. For those that jump out of the boat and swim, for those that row the boat, for those that continue to drag the net. Lord, may we remember. So many times I hear people saying, I can't make them come to church. Oh, drag them. That's what happened to those fish that day. Drag them. Lord, we all find our way to you somehow, but it's usually through somebody else before we understand it for your call. Thank you for all the people who keep letting down the net in their little boats and their big boats alike. Lord, may we never grow tired. May we never be weary. But may we feast on this. You the fish and the body of Christ Jesus himself. We ask this in the name of our Lord. Amen. Let's join in our hymn of invitation. Let us be in a mindset of being prayerful. If anyone says, hey, I... I never have been, been to Christ. I don't know who he is. Now is the time. Won't you come? Let us sing together.
seated, please. And if I could get two additional stewards, they have an extra pair of gloves there. It, it helps uh, with the way we're having to serve the sacraments at this point in time. I would invite to you all who love one another, earnestly repent of their sins, and seek to live in peace with Christ the Lord. This is his table, open to all. I think about those 153 fish and how they might have been unique and different, each and every one of them, and how unique and different God has made each of us, but still invites us to the feast. For on the night in which he was betrayed into the hands of sinners, he took bread and gave thanks to his Father in heaven and said, This is my body, broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Like that morning when they were cold and wet and tired, he offered them bread. Then following the meal, he raised the cup towards heaven, giving thanks to the Father of heaven once more. He said, This is my blood. It's been poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is a new covenant. Drink it all of you as often as you do so in remembrance of me. So it is in remembrance of these God mighty acts and deeds that we pray that the Holy Spirit fill this fellowship and make these to be for us the gifts of God, his redemptive blood, and his body for strength until we meet him again where he will be in final victory seated at the right hand at the banqueting table and all the saints will join together. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There are ten stations set. They will prepare and clear those as quickly as they possibly can. You may be in an attitude of prayer. You are free to go to Sunday school classes. You are free to stay in here as long as you want. The table is open. Won't you come and receive these, the gifts of God? gifts the body of Christ and the blood of our Lord broken and shed for you. Amen.